Right, but it's not turned off, I guess. I think we are live, John. It's is camera on? Just to double check. Yes, we can see the classroom. Okay, they can see the classroom. Oh, okay. No, no, Mohammed can hear me, I guess. So he's responding to me. Should be fine. All right, should be fine, I guess. All right. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, all right, so we're gonna continue with the second session today, as opposed to the first paper. This is from the past, not from the future. So this paper was uh, presented last year uh, at Micro 2021, and the paper is Cryptographic Capability Computing. Uh, we actually have a lot of uh, familiar names here who are close collaborators to Safari, for example, uh, Siri and, and Anand and perhaps more. Uh, and um, Marie is going to present the uh, paper today. She's a third year bachelor student. She's uh, studying at computer science department. Uh, so I guess without further ado, let's take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Jen. So hello everybody and welcome to my presentation of the paper Cryptographic Capability Computing or C cubed for short. So here you can see the authors. I can't, oh, okay. With the main author being Michael LeMay from Intel Labs in the US. Um, like John said, the paper was presented at Micro 21 in Greece. So let's start with the executive summary. To give you some background, um, loosely typed programming languages such as C or C++ introduce memory safety vulnerabilities. For example, buffer overflows or use after free. And those can give attackers an entry into your machine. Um, the problem this paper mainly aims to solve is that current mitigation systems against these violations require a lot of added state and only provide partial mitigation. The key idea this paper proposes is, is to use cryptography to encode pointers and the data that they point to. This is solved by the cryptographic cap capability computing that I will present now. And when uh, simulating this, the authors found that C cubed only has very low performance overhead and mitigates all tested vulnerabilities. To present this paper, I will start by giving some motivation and background. Then we will get into the deeper uh, paper summary. And finally, we will talk about strengths, weaknesses, and discuss. So let's start, oh, let's start, oh, sorry with what memory safety violations actually are. You might have heard of some um, attacks that use memory safety violations. For example, Row Hammer is an important attack, but this one is not too interesting to us right now. We will talk mostly about things like Heartbleed. Maybe you have heard of Heartbleed before. Um, this is an attack that, um, is, that happens when there's communication through an encrypted handshake, um, like TLS. And the attacker performs a buffer overread. So basically the attacker reads more than the victim would want. And this leads to passwords or private keys being uncovered. That's not good, of course. So let's go more into detail into, of what memory safety violations are. So they can be categorized into two different um, classes. Like the first one is the spatial, spatial safety violations. And the second one would be temporal safety violations. Spatial safety violations are, for example, um, buffer over or underflows. And temporal safety violations would be use after free. So when you use a point, uh, an allocation after it was uh, free. And other types of safety violations are usually due to errors in code or programming errors. So we'll not go into them right now. Let's start with this code. Can you please all take a look at this? And maybe um, just tell me if you see an issue with it. So on the top, we allocate some um, arrays and then we access them. Here we free something. Does anyone see an issue with this? If not, I'll explain it. So what we can see here is that there is memory safety vulnerabilities in these three places um, because we have two out of bounds accesses 
of allocation one and then we free allocation one and we access it again, which would be a use after free violation. So let's, um, yes, so what we gather from this is that memory safety violations seem very innocent and are easy to induce with such code. And you might have even done so accidentally on your own machine. And now we ask the question why they are actually a problem and how an attacker could exploit them. So let's look in more detail at buffer overflows. Here we see a buffer of the size of eight bytes and some adjacent memory to it. Now, what would happen if I had a password of 10 bytes and I wanted to enter that into this buffer? Well, what would happen would be that um, the two excess bytes would overwrite the adjacent memory. Now, an attacker could use this to overwrite those memory locations with their own code and potentially insert malicious code. Or also, that might give them access to your machine. So buffer overflows can be exploited. For temporal safety violations, see here an example of a use after free violation. You have three data objects and some pointers pointing to them. Now, what would happen if data one is freed? Well, then pointer one, if it's not set to null, would be a dangling pointer. This can now be exploited by an attacker because the attacker could pass malicious code into this empty allocation, and this could lead to bugs, but also to them controlling your system and also to control flow integrity violations. All right, so from this we gather that indeed memory safety violations are easy to induce and they are very dangerous and they can be exploited by attackers. So we really should mitigate them. Let's now look at what mechanisms are currently in place to mitigate them. So the paper mainly focuses the comparison on AOS and MTE, so I will only go into those. And to start with AOS, it was presented in this paper in Micro 2020. And what it mainly consists of is storing um, the bounds to which each pointer is allowed to access, in storing the bounds of the allocations to which pointer is allowed to access. And then on every memory access, you check whether the access is within the bounds that are allowed. And on the positive side, this uh, mitigates spatial safety violations because you cannot access out of bounds. Um, however, this also introduces high overhead of in-memory metadata. So it adds a lot of state because you have to store those bounds somewhere. So the second one they compared to is MTE, which was introduced in this paper in 2019. And MTE works by tagging the memory locations with four tag bits and then associating a pointer to those tag bits and then on every memory access checking whether this pointer corresponds to those tag bits. So on the positive side this mitigates use after free. However, this also has a lot of metadata overhead because you need to store these four tag bits and furthermore it does not mitigate um, out of bounds access because you basically only need to guess for bits, which is not that hard to do. All right, so we learned that MT and AOS come with a lot of metadata overhead and they don't fully mitigate all the vulnerabilities. All right, so let's go into the proposed solution. So first let's start with the goal of the paper. So like we said, it aims to mitigate memory safety vulnerabilities while overcoming the limitations of prior works. So those limitations were that there's added state, that there's restriction on memory layout, and that there's not good backwards compatibility. Let's go now into the proposed solution. So um, cryptographic capability computing. Um, the key idea of it is to use cryptographic hash func functions to encode the pointers. So um, this makes sense because cryptography is reliably secure, it's relatively fast, and the information can be stored in situ. So you can store everything inside of the pointer since it's um, encrypted, no one can read it. The main ideas of C-cubed are the use of cryptographic addresses. So those are um, encoded pointers that are used to identify allocations without added state. 
Um, what's also important is that all memory um, allocations are cryptographically isolated. So that means that every part of the memory that contains different data is, has a different cryptographic address than the others. Um, then it's also important to note that the data that cryptographic addresses point to is encrypted as well. And when there's a forbidden access, the memory is garbled. So that means that when um, a memory, saf memory safety vulnerability happens, the data is not usable anymore. So let's now take a look at flow of processing with C cubed. So here we have um, different allocations and we'll look at how um, different accesses to those allocations will be handled when using C cubed. So the first allocation is a regular allocation that's not really interesting. However, the second one is uh, contained inside of the first one. So it's like a sub part of the first allocation. The third allocation is special because it was freed and now it's reused by something else. The fourth allocation was freed and is now not used at all. And the fifth allocation is outside of the slot of the first allocation. So let's take a look at how a pointer that's allowed to access allocation one would be processed when it accesses allocation one. So first, the linear address is generated because we get a cryptographic address. So we have to first generate the linear address. And since that's inside of the right slot, the linear address will be valid. Then we generate a key stream and that is used to decrypt the data. And since this is inside of the right spot, the data will be valid as well. If we now look at what would happen if pointer one would want to access allocation two, then we would see that the um, linear address would still be correct because it's inside of the same address space. However, the key stream that would be generated is the same as for pointer one. So this would not correspond to the key stream that was used to encrypt um, allocation two. So it results in garbled data. And this is how um, C cubed mitigates out of bounds accesses. So for allocation three, if we now look at a different pointer that was allocating, um, that was pointing to um, allocation three before it was freed, if that one tried to point to it now again, then um, what would happen is that we would get a valid linear address because it's in the same address space. But um, the key stream is now not the same one as the new key stream, so the data would be garbled as well. And this is how CQ mitigates use after free. The same thing happens for allocation four, only that it's not used. And for allocation five, that would be the case of a non-adjacent um, out of bounds. Um, since we are far away from allocation one, but we're using the pointer that was used for allocation one, we would even get a garbled linear address because this is not the right um, yes, um, address space. All right, so we see that um, C cubed uses cryptographic addresses and data encryption to mitigate vulnerabilities and mitigates them quite well. All right. Now we can ask the question how this pointer encoding actually works. So here what you can see is a cryptographic address. It's divided into five distinct parts. And um, the first one is the power. The power um, determines the size of the offset bits. And um, when it's all zeros, that means that it's not a cryptographical address, cryptographic address, but actually just a normal pointer. So it does not point to encrypted data. Um, then we have the version that's optional and it helps with the cryptographical isolation of the memory allocations. Then there's the encrypted address that's the upper part of the address and this is encrypted using a K cipher. The fixed address is the lower parts of the address and this is uh, in plain bits so you can read it. However, um, the encrypted address as well as the fixed address are both immutable and we will look at why that is in a minute. The offset is not really important to us right now. So let's look at the flow of encryption. So how we get from a regular pointer to a cryptographic address. On the top, you have the regular pointer and you can see that some things can just be copied down like the fixed address and the offset. 
Um, and the interesting part is here in the middle, we have the K cipher. And what needs to be provided to be able to encrypt this is a pointer key, the optional version and the power field. So what's interesting here is that the fixed address is actually um, folded together with the power field using some operation. In this case, it's an XOR, but it could be something else to generate the tweak. So the tweak is a value that's used during the encryption. And that's how we get the encrypted address. And actually the tweak is also needed during the decryption. So that means that if someone were to change the fixed address of the cryptographic address, the decryption would not work anymore because the tweak needs to remain the same. And here you can see the decoding flow. Otherwise, most of the errors can just be um, reversed and the version is dropped. Yeah, you need to provide the pointer key again. So let's uh, look at how this works on the lower levels. So how does the memory controller handle such encrypted pointers? Let's start with the load pipeline. The store pipeline is very similar, but I will focus on the load pipeline in this um, presentation. So here we would have a regular load pipeline. So an unsecure baseline with no um, security mechanism implemented. So what happens is we start with the address generation unit that gives us um, the virtual address. Then we need to look that up inside of the TLB. Then um, on an, a cache hit, we would read the data and write it back. And how would that look now if we add the cryptographic address? So what happens is that the address generation unit does not return us a normal address, but a, an encrypted address. So we can't look up inside of the TLB right away. And this adds three cycles of latency directly to the critical path of the pipeline, which leads to 5% performance loss. So this is not really a good thing. And the authors, sorry, the authors mitigated this um, and came up with a system called pre predictive TLB lookup or short PRED TLB. So what PRED TLB does is it uses the fact that the lower 34 bits of the cryptographic address are actually in plain text. So, so they're not encrypted at all. And these can be used for a partial TLB lookup. So there's no, wait, uh, no need to wait for the result of the decryption. They can already start with these lower bits. And yeah, of course this can result in mispredictions. And Let's now look at the load pipeline using the spread TLB. So the difference is, of course, here, after getting the address, you would directly predictively look up and you would get the result of the decryption before the write back. So then you would have to still check whether or not this was correct. Um, on the misprediction, you would go back and start from the beginning. And on the um, correct prediction, you would just write back. And actually what the authors noticed with this was that um, PRED-TLB uh, has a very, very high success rate. And so there's basically no added latency when using C-cubed. All right, so this tells us that the load and store pipeline with C-cubed have basically no performance impact when we're using PRED-TLB. So let's now go into the evaluation. So this was simulated on CIMIX with an unmodified clear Linux US. And it was tested mostly for legacy compatibility, performance and security. Let's start with legacy compatibility. So what that means is basically the same thing as backwards compatibility. It's just that the authors were asking themselves what has to be changed in current systems for this to be able to be implemented. And basically methods working close to the pointer had to be adapted, such as realloc or free. However, malloc did not have to be implemented and pointer arithmetic worked fine. So also system calls to the kernel had to be changed because the kernel does not know how to work with encrypted addresses. So they added a temporary buffer between um, the callee and the kernel and they copied the decrypted data into that and then passed down the pointer to the a buffer to the kernel. Also methods using SIMD instructions were altered because those usually take more than the allocations that they need and that could lead to buffer um, overflows like string length, copy and memcopy. 
So basically, this tells us that only a few functions had to be changed, and this means that it's pretty good um, backwards compatibility. Let's now look into performance. So um, they simulated some C and C++ workloads that you can see here. And what you can see is the orange bars are not important to us right now. The black bars are C cubed without Pret TLB and the blue bars that we don't really see are C cubed with Pret TLB. So what we can see is that, at the, look at the upper graph, please. What we can see is that the blue um, bar is basically merged with the X axis. So there's basically no overhead. The lower you go, the higher the overhead is. And what we can also see, yes, it's at 0.01% actually. Um, what we can see on the lower graph is that the success rate of Pret TLB is almost at 100%, so at 99.85%. So that's really impressive. So with Pret TLB, C cubed actually has negligible performance overhead. If we now compare that to the previously mentioned um, mitigation mechanisms, MTE and AOS, um, we get this graph where C cubed is again the blue line almost merged with the X axis. Um, MTE is an orange and AOS is the dashed line. And we see that MTE actually has quite the high performance overhead. It has 7%, AOS has 3.6%. Uh, C cubed has 4.9, and with Pret TLB, it has only 0.01%. So C cubed clearly has a very, uh, way better performance than MTE and AOS when using Pret TLB. So that's good, but let's now take a look at the security evaluation because this is actually the most important one. So um, this was tested on the Juliet test suit for C and C++ that contains a lot of um, files that uh, on purpose contain errors to test if they are mitigated or not. And they mostly tested heap-based buffer overflow and use after free. And what they found was that for heap-based buffer overflow um, without data encryption, so only using the cryptographic address and not encrypting the data that it points to, they already mitigated 87% of all the issues. And with adding data encryption to that, they mitigated 100% of the issues. For use after free, it was similarly impressive. They mitigated all of um, the vulnerabilities that they tested. So C cubed mitigates all vulnerabilities and it actually does so better than most other methods. Let's go to the conclusion. So C cubed is the first stateless memory security mechanism. Um, that uses data encryption on top of pointer encryption and improves um, memory vulnerability mitigation. Um, it can be implemented with negligible performance overhead. Um, yes. And it's more secure and faster than current mechanisms that we have. So let's talk about strengths and weaknesses of the paper. So for strength, I found that this paper combined um, really simple ideas into an elegant solution. So for example, the encryption of data or this predictive lookup does not really seem like something brand new that we've never heard about, but it's um, used in a really elegant way. And the solution is very impressive when looking at the test results. Also, I really enjoyed that there were so many comparisons to other mitigation methods in this paper. So not only the ones that I mentioned, but there were almost one and a half page, pages of comparisons to many, many solutions. And in all of those comparisons, C cubed comes out on top. So that's very impressive. And also they put a lot of attention on backwards compatibility and not much changes are needed, which means that this could really be implemented. And yeah, that's good, I think. So maybe some weaknesses of the paper. Um, I felt like some aspects were not really mentioned as deeply as they should have been. So, for example, the garbling of the data is mentioned, but not really explained. So we don't really know how it's garbled. They mentioned it's garbled across the whole memory hierarchy. Does that mean the data is lost? Does that um, induce any performance overhead or something? Um, also, they don't really talk about the encryption of the data, only very shortly. 
um, they don't really mention where new instructions would be implemented. And also maybe the lower um, text bytes could be exploited. That's not really mentioned either. Um, then it would also be interesting to know um, how this works on a real processor because this paper only mentions simulations, so that might be um, something for further research. So what we gathered so far is that there is memory safety vulnerabilities such as buffer overflows or use after free, and those give attackers an entry into the machine. Um, and current mitigation systems require added state. And um, cryptographic capability computing was proposed to solve the issue of this added state and actually performs very, uh, very well and mitigates all tested vulnerabilities. So my takeaways are that this would really be a good alternative to current memory safety mechanisms because it's secure, it's really fast, and it doesn't need many changes to current systems. And also there's opportunity for research. So let's go into the discussion. Um, to start, does anyone have any questions? No, okay. Then I guess we can start with the first question that would be, What's the reason for this immense speed up that we see when using C cubed? Because I mean, this is really an impressive difference between the other methods and C cubed. Does anyone have ideas? So I guess I could take away one thing in the beginning, that's this use of pret TLB that we saw. So that, of course, increased the um, the speed of this method by a lot. Maybe something else. Uh, so you mentioned you mentioned that C three is this first. I mean C three C cube. I don't know C uh, C cube. Yeah, this is the first solution that implements this type of detection stateless. So. I mean, if the other mechanisms have a lot of state, that's like, uh, I can imagine there's going to be bottlenecks uh, if you have concurrent accesses and then you try to look up the state all the time. And then, yeah, I mean, physically you have fan out limitations or stuff, so it may result in the bottleneck. Yeah, exactly. That's, I thought of that as well. You don't have to match any tags or like go fetch any data or anything. You have everything you need inside of the pointer. So yeah, that I agree with that. Um, does anyone have any other things to say about the performance of C-cubed? I guess one point that goes kind of against this would be um, the question of those forbidden data accesses. When the data is garbled, how does the program work with that afterwards? Does that induce any performance overhead? If that's not really mentioned. Maybe we could discuss it. Do you have any ideas? I mean, this could be done in a way similar to, for example, there's this technology called pointer authentication arm. And I mean, that's for more for jumping, uh, I mean, branching instructions, but you could always detect if it's actually a failure of decryption, for example, you can have a, a, a I don't know, a marking number of bits. Uh, you have a pattern inside and then if you don't match it against the part pattern, the you can detect that this is actually the decryption didn't work and then you can just how to say trap the instruction saying that yeah this is a illegal pointer yeah and that and then they basically abort the user space program or if they have a way to handle that yeah. yeah yeah thanks that makes sense does anyone else have any comments on this then let's move on to the next point um that might be a little interesting to you since you presented Speckhammer last week. So do you think known attacks would be mitigated? I will go over some really quickly. So Spectre, um, maybe you remember that. That was when we use branch mis mispredictions and then speculative execution to um, get observable behavior. Then there was the Speckhammer where row hammer was used to induce those branch predictions. And then, of course, there's the hot bleed that I mentioned in the beginning. Do you think um, those would be mitigated, or what would be the pros and cons of this solution? I 
I guess I could start with a spectre, for example. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, the explanation of heartbeat. Um, so for spectre, I think that since the data is encrypted, it's not that big of a deal if the um, if the attacker would have observable behavior because maybe they would find this data, but it's encrypted, so they can't really see it. But on the other hand, the data has to be decrypted somewhere. So um, that's also not really mentioned in the paper, like at what point it's decrypted and where it's stored in a decrypted way. So that would maybe be interesting. Do you think that would also be a problem for Speckhammer? Or is there maybe some other problem? So for Speckhammer, I think it's pretty much the same thing in the beginning, but then also C-cube does not have Roheimer mitigation. So it's not the same thing. And maybe that could also be used in some way. So that might be a bad point. And for Heartbleed, do you remember? Um, I explained in the beginning. So basically it's that there's, a, there's no bounce check and the attacker can simply perform out of bounce read do you think that would be possible using C cubed? I guess not because you'd have just random or not random, but some kind of garbled data, right? Mm -hmm. You have something, but it's not representative of what's actually yeah. going over. Yeah, that's true. That's what I thought as well. It would just result in garbled data. But then there's this thing that we talked about before. We don't really know how the data will be recovered after or if that leads to performance loss or anything. Do you guys know any other um, attacks that might be mitigated by this or might not be mitigated? So basically, this is against uh, read of, I mean, we protect against malicious reads against memory, right? So it's not only for data or, uh, but also maybe for instructions. Uh, and I imagine maybe you can have a way of mitigating against the old type of like crafting gadgets and stuff because you, 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 you somehow, basically you retrofit pointer authentication back into the system, right? It's like you have, instruction memory and then you reuse that to limit some type of unauthorized access into instruction memory but i mean it's just it, i don't have a concrete attack mm -hmm. of that pattern yet yeah sure yeah. it's fine thanks then let's maybe go over to the next point um there i wanted to ask you do you have any idea where should the pointer encryption be implemented do you think it makes more sense to implement it as a software routine or as a hardware instruction so this would be the encryption flow and decryption flow that we saw on the slides earlier I would imagine if you're doing it all in software, it would be significantly slower and you might see a bit of performance penalty for it, mm -hmm. but you would get the flexibility of say that that encryption you know, is no longer yeah. very useful. Like it kind of, you need something new or for whatever reason you have that flexibility. Whereas in hardware, yeah, you get fast, but you're stuck with whatever you have and that's yeah. the end of it. I'd say. Yeah, thanks. Does anyone else have another idea? So um, I think what you said was correct. Maybe another thing interesting that's interesting for the hardware instruction would be that um, the processor could protect this encryption key and that would lead to more safety because it's harder to recover it from um, hardware instructions. And like you said, hardware optimization, and I think it would be maybe cheaper to write a software routine than to change hardware instructions, but I don't think that's a big point. Does anyone else have comments on this? No, All right. then let's move on to possible improvements. Do you have any ideas how 
this method could possibly be improved. I know it's hard because it's basically uh, um, perfect. I mean, if it mitigates 100% of the vulnerabilities and has no overhead. Um, I thought of one, maybe. I mean, it's kind of an improvement and not an improvement. You could maybe encrypt the entire address, and I think that may lead to more security. But on the other hand, that would also kind of remove the ability to do um, pred TLB. And then that, that would maybe not be good for performance. Do you have any ideas along those lines? Yeah, go ahead. I, I think if you encrypted the whole address as well, you wouldn't really be guaranteed consecutive physical memory, uh, which can be very useful for a lot of things. So I think it leaves 34 bits, which is a huge amount. So that's yeah. mostly fine for most applications. But if you're encrypting everything as well, and you have your physical address just scattered around memory, that would probably hurt performance quite a bit, yeah. I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyone else have any ideas on um, how this could be improved in some way? Mm, yeah, okay. Well, then let's go to the next point. So um, what do you think would be the impact of implementing those functions again, like um, free and realloc? They would have to be changed to basically decrypt this cryptographic address. Do you think that would have performance impacts or something similar? Oops. Yeah, exactly. Or would this have an impact on the cost? Or do you think this makes it less likely to be implemented because it's it's kind of fundamental functions that have to be changed? Maybe one thing I could say to this likelihood of being implemented that was also mentioned in the paper was that um, Google actually um, also changed um, the implementation of a couple of um, point to close functions like free and allocation for some of their use cases. So I guess it's doable, but yeah, I don't know if it has any impact on performance or cost. I guess that would maybe depend on the implementation itself. Um, but that would be interesting for further research also to see more in detail how that would be done. All right, so if no one else has any comments, I guess thank you for your attention and thank you to, uh, to my uh, mentors. And yeah, that's it. Mohammed. So we finished early today. Uh, we can take any comments from anyone, basically. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can we can hear you. Uh, we just uh, turned off the camera. Yeah, the camera was frozen for a bit. If anyone has any comment, maybe you can speak up uh, related to the two papers from student, from the team. I guess if no one has comments, I'll make a couple of comments here. Uh, so thanks for the presentations. This, these were two very recent papers. One of them is kind of into the future, as you have discussed. Uh, and you can see that uh, people are taking uh, different approaches to different problems using cryptography and hopefully sound, uh, uh, let's say, pure, uh, perfectly secure approaches. Uh, I will comment on the first one first. Uh, the first one is, I think, interesting. It's, a, it's an integrity checking approach as was analyzed. It's not a new approach, but it's an approach that's applied to Rohammer. Uh, I think there were multiple papers actually recently that was written with this approach. 
Uh, I think it's good to certainly examine these approaches. One of the downsides I see uh, with these is the overhead is very high in terms of what you do. Uh, so it's not clear uh, that these can these should be used alone. Uh, one of the papers that was mentioned argues that this sort of integrity checking should be used in addition to other Rohammer solutions. There was some discussion on that. And that makes a lot more sense uh, than just using this approach. Uh, and this sort of integrity checking actually uh, does not need to be customized for Rohammer. It could be general memory integrity checking that enables uh, protection against many types of bit flips, right? Not just Rohammer. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I think the major uh, potential issue with these approaches is the overheads associated with them. Uh, and I think going forward, we will have, uh, we will need to develop solutions that are more efficient. Uh, and maybe rely on high overhead solutions at a coarser granularity, uh, maybe with and without hardware support. I guess we'll see. Uh, so there, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, on the second one, I think the second one is quite interesting because it targets a different class of, uh, let's say, safety issues or security issues. Uh, and uh, that's a relatively new approach also. Uh, it was proposed purely by Intel, as you can see. So... I guess we'll see if it uh, goes into real life. Uh, there's not much to comment on uh, over there, in my opinion, unless someone has uh, more comments. So it's definitely good to uh, have uh, new solutions to uh, problems like buffer overflows and uh, attacks that uh, take advantage of, of, of such things. Okay, I don't have any other comments. Uh, but I think this, uh, hopefully this encourages people to think uh, toward maybe simpler uh, directions uh, to handle such issues. Uh, Mohammed, I think I'll leave it uh, to you now and we can end early. All right, thank you so much, Honor. Uh, so I will enable the quiz right now so you can take it directly. Uh, thanks for the two students for the presentation and the mentors as well. Thanks, everyone. So see you next week. Bye-bye.